We will be covering the eighth message in our series, Hold On to Jesus, as we walk through Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. So um, we're doing a series in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and, and this will be, um, we're going to be covering chapter 5, uh, parts of chapter 5. So um, if you want to go ahead and kind of get to that, I'll have all the scriptures on the screens, but um, we'll be in chapter 5 and, and not the full thing today. Um, instead of splitting the message in a particular passage or section of scripture or covering the whole chapter, which I was planning on doing, but I felt the Spirit lead me uh, instead to cover just uh, the two main issues that I see within this chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians that Paul's addressing the church and, and splitting it into two different uh, Sundays. In case you're new uh, this morning with us or have missed some of the messages, just as a reminder, you can always go back and, and like the First Church of God Facebook page and you can watch the entire service or you can go on our church's website um, and you can see a YouTube video of just the sermon portion in that and you can recap. All of the sermons are on that as well. As a, as a further recap, Paul, um, just on about the First Corinthians letter, Paul wrote this letter because... Um, the church in Corinth was not doing well. This is not one of those letters, pleasant letters that you might have received uh, in your life when you went to camp or something or college and from your mom or grandparent that just said, oh, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. Um, you're just a joy to be in the family. Maybe you haven't received that letter. Um, uh, on occasion, I did receive those letters. Um, but this wasn't a pleasant letter that they were receiving um, it was not. It was more of a correction letter. The church in Corinth had been Ill, infiltrated by the pagan culture of their time, the sinful culture of their time. It had allowed the sinful practices and ideologies to corrupt the sanctity of Jesus' church. As we heard last week, Paul was the spiritual father of the church body in this region, Corinth region, which is just kind of near Greece, okay, that's the best way for me to describe it without getting my laser point and getting the map back up there, but uh, as a spiritual father means that he was the one that led this region of people to know Christ and to understand the gospel and to establish the church. So Paul was a, responsible for overseeing the spiritual development even though he was a missionary and Paul was moving all over the Mediterranean region. He was everywhere. For, for, he was people, at places for a year. He was places for multiple years. But he was everywhere and rarely had opportunities to, just to stay in one spot other than the places he was uh, establishing. So he might be through this region of Corinth maybe once a year or even maybe less than that. Maybe once every two to three years. Paul left the churches under the care, though, like the church of Corinth, under the care of elders and overseers. We even read, uh, as we read last week in chapter 4, that Paul was sending Timothy, who was his apprentice, to remind and to demonstrate to them... The, uh, ...demonstrate to the church what it what looked like to walk like an apostle... To live like one of the apostles, which again, that was people who were completely surrendered to God and, and God's will for their life. They were captives, though, as Paul gives this illustration that's really cool in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, again, if you remember from last week, of a Roman parade that would come in after they would conquer, Rome would conquer uh, a civilization, they would come in and then they would pray to have this celebration through the city where the Roman soldiers would be holding up all the loot and things that they had received, and, and they came in with victors, like a victor's parade. And then at the very end of the victor's parade was a group of now slaves and captives that, were, that they fought against that were going to be sent and thrown into the Colosseum to be killed by wild animals or to be used as a spectacle. And Paul says, you Corinthians were like the people that prayed in. You're the ones that are like the Romans praying in in victory, but us apostles, the real apostles of Christ, are the ones that are being prated in to be killed at the end, like slaves. And so he gives this uh, stark difference between what an apostle should look like and how these Corinthians are actually acting like. And Paul was telling them, don't follow the patterns of this world, but follow me as I imitate Christ. Trust me, follow me, I am I'm willing to die for Christ. Imitate me. Use me as your guide. I can only imagine people coming to Paul to report to him how the churches are doing. And the one that came to report to Paul about how the church in Corinth was doing. Um, 
and, and saying, hey, Paul, the church is acting in this way or, or in that way. Is that how they're supposed to be acting? Fully knowing that this is wrong, I'm sure, the person. But once Paul did kind of har- harshen his view of it. But Paul is saying with his mouth dropping, are you kidding me? No! That's definitely not how we're supposed to be acting. That's definitely not how I told them that they're supposed to act. They're supposed to follow my example. That's not the example that I made for them to live. That's not the example that I left for them to follow. You know, yesterday uh, I had an opportunity to see uh, one of my, my son's football games. And I was sitting with a group of dads. And um, we were kind of making a, a joke because my son has got a reputation now of falling down and laying on the ground after a hit for a while. And um, those of you that know me, I, like, I, that, I am not like that whatsoever. Um, but the dads, the dads are, I know I'm a pastor and I look frail, but I'm a pretty tough guy. Um, so um, I broke my arm and had my mom, broke my arm in multiple places and shattered my wrist and I had my mom come and tape my arm up so that I could just move my fingers, even though my wrist was like this, broken. And I said, just tape my hand up like this and I'll just run and catch a football like this and I'll still get a touchdown and I'll make sure I don't fall. That, that was me, so I'm not tooting my horn, but that's me. But my son lays on the ground after a hit and he's down there and, and I'm like, we, anyway, he did that, and we all yelled, get up! I had all the dads help me yell, get up. And he's always okay. That's my point. He's always okay. But some of them asked me this question. Zach, is that how you were? You're all, he's awfully dramatic. And I said, that's definitely not me. That's definitely not my example. That must be his mother. But Paul was saying, follow my leading in my direction. Actually, my wife is really tough. So I have no idea where he got it from. My wife, I shouldn't say that. She's very tough. Tougher than me, honey. Paul was sending this letter, though, to be distributed on his behalf to the church in Corinth in hopes that the negative reports that he was receiving about this church in Corinth would cause them to change their ways and to help them to live as a true reflection of Christ. Now remember, as I said this, this is not like when I say the church at Corinth, it wasn't one building where all the people came in and worshipped in. It wasn't like the first church of God. It was a bunch of house churches all over like a, an area the size of Illinois, right? So like a big area. So this is a lot of different congregations different groups of people that met in caves and and on hillsides and inside people's houses. And so this is hard. So this letter had to be distributed to every single person in this region so they had an understanding. And that was Paul's desire of writing this letter. And from the outside, it was hard, though, for the church, as Paul, as we read this letter, to distinguish the church from the unsaved citizens of Corinth. It was hard to see which is which. There should be a stark difference between God's redeemed people... And those who are still trapped and are slaves to sin. For the Corinthians, there were too many similarities, though, between them, when the outside world would look at them, and those that are still lost in sin. Like, they look the same. They look like there's no difference between how they live their lives. And unfortunately, I think this problem that Paul's addressing with the church in Corinth Corinth, still seems to be around today. The powerful influences of this pagan culture that is affected them in Corinth and even today in America is still impacting the purity of God's church. The Corinthians had become Christians. Surely they had become Christians. I'm not questioning that. But they had not successively shed all the influences of the world around them. They accepted Jesus, but they were still allowing the evil culture to impact them and to be a part of their lives. And that's what Paul was trying to address. There was gross immorality in the church in Corinth, and it was being tolerated by the leadership in the church. So through chapters 5 and 6 in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the church they must exercise church discipline. But today I'm not going to cover that portion of the chapter. I will cover that next week, church discipline. So come back and hear about church discipline. I'm sure that everyone here is so excited to hear about what church discipline looks like and how it should be applied to our lives. Actually, I'm sure none of you want to hear about that. 
Because none of us want to be disciplined. No, no one likes to be disciplined. But there's a reason the state of the church is the way that it is. There's a reason why we see things happening across the world and, and, our, and, and across even America that we just can't understand is happening within the church. And there's a reason things are being allowed that would never have been allowed within the church just 30 years ago or 40 years ago. You know, I often look at it as like, sometimes I, I, I coach sports, uh, basketball and, and baseball, and I'm around kids all the time. I used to be a youth pastor for many, many years. And you can progressively see kids becoming more and more disrespectful. I'm sure that's not a, I see heads nodding all over, okay? Getting more and more disrespectful. Where, where I know, like, I mean, I graduated high school 20 years ago, and I know that I wasn't, I remember parents saying that to me, well, not necessarily to me, but to my generation, about how disrespectful we are compared to them, and I now look at how respectful I was, and I can't believe how disrespectful the kids are today in comparison to just 20 plus years ago. But it's that progression that when you don't enforce discipline in life, you get someone who doesn't live by rules and just lives for themselves. Okay, sorry, I got ahead of myself. That's next week. Discipline's next week. Sorry. Um, come back next week and hear all about uh, discipline because it's very important. I think it's, some, it's, it's something that we need to have incorporated still because it's a biblical practice. And it's because we've stopped doing that that you see the results within our communities of believers. Today our attention is going to be on the immorality, though, uh, that is being tolerated within the Corinthian church. The Corinthians couldn't see it, but it was having detrimental effects to their church. It was stunting their spiritual growth. It was killing their witness. It was causing internal divisions among them. It was hindering their worship. And it was going directly against the will of God for their lives. God had freed them to be set apart, to be different, but it came at a cost. He asked in, Jesus asked in Luke 9, 23, I think I have the verse up there. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Then in Galatians 2, 20, it says, I've been crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. See, it comes at a cost. Following Jesus comes at a cost. Being his follower, being his be a believer in Christ comes at a cost. When we are saved by the blood of Jesus, we are not just accepting God's forgiveness. We are choosing to be crucified with Christ. I think we forget that. Yes, Jesus forgives your sins... And he takes all your sinfulness, but you're making a choice by having him free you from your sins. You're choosing to surrender to him, saying, God, I want you to forgive my sins, and in repayment, I'm giving you myself so that I can be yours. We are choosing to say goodbye, and with that, we're choosing to say goodbye to this, to living for this world and saying, I will follow Jesus instead, and I will not follow this world anymore. Look what James says, who's the brother of Jesus, to a group of believers who are struggling with this same issue that Paul is addressing with allowing immorality within the church and within believers. He says this in James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Wow. Wow. That's one of those verses that it, it just slaps you across the face, right? It makes you start thinking, man, how, ooh, man, am I, in, am I allowing this world to be a friend of mine? Or am I making an enemy like God calls me to? I hope we all heard that loud and clear that James is putting out there. James is calling any Christians who, again, I'm talking to Christians this morning, any Christians who continue to be friends with this world, he calls you a, an adulterer, a cheater. Which would imply that we are cheating on the covenant that we make with God at repentance by making the world our friend and not our enemy. But who are we cheating on and how are we cheating on according to James? The answer is God, of course. But how is being friends with the world the equivalent of like, cheating on your spouse? Well, it starts by Christians understanding 
a very important truth that, again, we are paid for. We were paid for at a very high price to become sons and daughters of Jesus. We were paid for. It's not, I know he offers salvation and I, it's always said, oh, it's a free gift. Absolutely. It wasn't free for Jesus. He offers it freely to us, but it was not free for him. He paid a very high price. He, he took on our debt. It's, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So wages. So there's a payment that must be made. And we all have this debt because of our sin. From the moment we're born, there's sin because of the sin of fall of Adam. But then beyond that, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so there's this debt. And so when Jesus died on the cross, it says that it says, if you read in the English version, it says it is finished. But there's this Greek word that's used that is actually translated to called tetaliste. And I have it on there. And that word tetaliste means it is finished. And that word was used in that time to signify the payment of a debt. So if you have a debt on a loan or a lien, they would write tetaliste on it. So when Jesus said it is finished, he actually said tetaliste, which meant not that I am done. My job is done. What he's saying is, your debt is paid, world. I am paying your debt. And it came at my blood, the cost of my blood and my life. God made that sacrifice so you could be his. And that he could be yours. That you can have the relationship with him that he always wanted us to have. That he created us to have. That we talked about earlier. But the Corinthian church and I believe the church in America today are far from allowing ourselves to be fully God's holy possession. Wouldn't you agree with that? If you read the Old Testament and look how sacred the, they treated the tabernacle and the temple. I mean they put... Gold all over it, overlaid it all with gold, and they had all these processes for cleansing. They couldn't even the the, the high priest could not even go into the tabernacle without even cl before cleansing himself of his sinfulness. And so there's all these processes, and you must stay this far away, and you must do this, and you must do that, all to keep it sacred and cleansed and held up, set apart as holy. I mean, that's the entire book of law is about. Look at how they kept themselves as God's people and also the God's people, his chosen people, how sacred. They, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. They had to do all these different things in order to keep themselves as a people holy and sacred. Why were they supposed to treat the tabernacle and the temple in that manner? Well, it's where God's presence was. And what about his people? Why were they, why were they supposed to be set apart? Well, because they were his holy possession. They were his. They belonged to him. He, he rescued them out of Egypt. He brought them out. He brought them through the wilderness. They were his people, his holy possession that he took ownership of, that he chose. And for us as believers today, the spirit of God comes and dwells in us at salvation. And what that means is, I just want to make sure you understand. So if they treated the temple in that manner... And as God's chosen people, God chose us all to be redeemed. And for all of us that have accepted Jesus in their heart, that means the Spirit of God comes and dwells inside of us. And if he's thought, man, i got to keep this tent sacred, what do you think he thinks about you being sacred? If God's presence had to be sacred in a tent that went through the wilderness and went through the desert for 40 years, and then, then a building, a temple, and overlaid with gold, what do you think he thinks about your life? which he houses himself in through the Holy Spirit. I think it's the same rules apply. Holy, sacred, set apart. Do we do a good job of keeping ourselves sanctified as God's holy possession? What about your life? Just take a second and evaluate your life. Are you keeping your life holy and sanctified, set apart as God's church? God, and when I say church, I mean the body of Christ. Are you keeping your life holy and sanctified as God has always called us to do? This is what Paul is showing the church and, and what I think God wants to remind us of this morning. The Corinthians have not kept themselves holy for God. Look what Paul says in just these first four verses of chapter 5 that we're going to cover. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that I'm a man, uh, I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. 
And you should remove this man from your fellowship, even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can you hear Paul's tone in this just short section? He's stern. But in, in the same sense, I can hear his concern over the state of the church. His concern about the progression in their life. He's, he's concerned about the believers. He's worried about what they're allowing to happen among themselves because of the sin that's taking place by this one man and that they're allowing. You know, they're proud. They're, they're ignoring it because they're just proud about who they are. And they're ignoring this sin, this, this blatant bad sin right in front of their faces. As we've covered in previous chapters, there's plenty of other sins that we've addressed in 1 Corinthians and that we will continue to address. But Paul takes a second and covers this, this one sin of this man as an example. And the church is allowing this, this sin to happen without any sort of recourse. For just a little background, the Gentile world in, in Corinthians uh, did not know the meaning of chastity or purity. Uh, that was not a practice ...within their culture. They took their pleasures when and wherever they wanted to take it. Oftentimes, they had, when they would... ...the pagan culture of that time... ...they would worship uh, idols and stuff... ...and it always in, involved sexual practices with prostitutes. Always involved that. Okay? It was very difficult for the church uh, in Corinth... ...to escape the influence of this attitude... ...and this mindset that they've always had... ...which, again, seems like it's a relatable thing for us today... The sexualization of culture back then was infiltrating the Christians of today. And I'd say it's the same thing that's happening today in the American church and all across the world. The Corinthian church had come so newly into Christianity, it was so difficult for them to unlearn the practices which generations of Corinthians knew about and had participated in before knowing Christ. Yet if the church was to be pure as, and set apart as God had called them to be, they must Deny the old ways. Deny the old practices in order to follow Jesus. In the church of Corinth, a man, again, had formed an illicit relationship with his own stepmother. And a thing that's gross, even to non-believers. And it's explicitly forbidden in the Jewish law. Shocked as Paul was of this sin that this man was partaking in. And uh, Paul was more shocked at the attitude of the Corinthian church. He was disgusted by this man's actions, but people do sinful things, so he, under, he, he sees that. Not that he's saying it's okay, it needs to be addressed, but he was more upset about the church allowing it to happen and not changing it. They had accepted the situation and done nothing about it when they should have been grief-stricken, as Paul says. The Greek word that Paul uses to kind of describe this Greek grief is actually a word that they would also use as mourning over someone's death. So not like they, their attitude shouldn't have been like, oh man, we, they, you know you really shouldn't be doing that. That's not good for your life. No, it should be like crying, wailing, moaning. I can't believe you're doing this in your life. You experienced Jesus. I can't believe you're allowing this back in your life. Wailing, moaning over someone's blatant sin. When we cease to take a serious view of sin, we're willingly placing ourselves in a very perilous position. Remember, Christ died to set us free from the bondage of sin. So it's our sin. It was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. And because of that, no Christian should ever take an easygoing view of sin. Oh, it's just a part of life. We're never going to fully escape it. That's the easygoing mindset that this world wants us to have. We need to have this mindset. My sin, the sin of Zach Schaefer through all his life, is the reason why my Savior had to die. It was my sin that killed Jesus Christ. It was my sin that made God send his one and only son to be the remission for my sins. It was my sin. And because it was my sin that killed Jesus, God, I need to understand that God... Uh, that should shape my mind, and I need to understand that God detests sin so much. He literally casts mankind out of the garden because of sin. Because he is holy, God is holy, he can't be in the presence of sin. And that's why he can't be in a, we can't be in a relationship with him without 
Jesus' atoning blood and his payment on the cross for us to atone for our debt. Because of all of this, we should take it serious and flee from sin as Paul tells us to do, to flee from sin. Recently, I've heard um, through social media and from conversations with people that Jesus has been used as like, almost like a scapegoat for allowing sin in our lives. I've heard this constantly. Maybe you've heard this as well. Well, Jesus, Jesus ate and hung out with prostitutes and sinners, and, and he didn't condemn them. So because Jesus didn't condemn them in Scripture of their sin, that must mean it, it's okay. Jesus is okay with sin. He's okay with that lifestyle. He's okay with that because he doesn't condemn. And, and, and it's true that Jesus did hang out with sinners and prostitutes and all these different types of people. That was opposite of what the culture taught at that time. And yeah, Jesus did. In John 3, 17, it does say that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it through him. Yes, that's all true. Yes, Jesus hung out with prostitutes, drunkards, and outcasts. But here's the thing. Although he hung out with those people, by the time Jesus was finished with them, they were no longer the same people. They were no longer the same after experiencing Jesus and his grace and his mercy. They were changed. They were no longer the same in that he, he called them to a changed life. He called them to change. Jesus came to transform people, not to indulge with them. Christianity is about surrender, not Comfort. We are to align to God's standards, not God aligning to our standards or the standards of this world. Also, if you read the entire Bible, you get a full rounded picture of who Jesus is. So this, this picking, nitpicking on certain verses and saying, see, look, at that's Jesus. That's really who Jesus is. He's the guy who hangs out with prostitutes and all the, all the sinners of this world. And he, he was a partier. He was a partier, man. He really loved hanging out with them. No, you get, if you read the whole Bible, you get the full spectrum. So let's just skip to the end where it says that Jesus will return in power and authority to do what? To judge the living and the dead. To judge. Okay, not to party with anybody, but to judge and send people to eternal places. Then we can skip over to the beginning of the Bible and, and think about Jesus. And in John 1, it says that Jesus was there at the beginning and everything was created through him. According to John 1. Okay, so he's there at the beginning, and, and Jesus is the physical. We also know that Jesus is the physical representation of who God is, the Father is. So if you want to know who the Father is, know Jesus. And if you want to know who Jesus is, know the Father, because they are one. Do you not think that when Jesus was up in heaven with God in the beginning, before he came down, when God made the decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their total depravity, do you not think that Jesus was not up there with God? When God was throwing down the sulfur rocks to destroy every person and living thing in Sodom and Gomorrah, do you not think Jesus was there? Nope, Jesus was there. And I can tell you what, Jesus was not saying, oh no, Father, please, leave them alone. Don't do that. No, 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 you can't do that. Absolutely not. You know why? Because Jesus and God are one. They are one. Jesus wasn't just sitting there saying, no, 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 no. Jesus was there and agreed with it. And Jesus says he died. To, God says that he had sent Jesus and that Jesus would die to free us and to separate his people from the sinfulness of this world. Jesus calls his followers to leave behind the attachments to this sinful world and to create a deep attachment to him. That is greater than all other attachments that we have in this life. Becoming a follower of Christ gives us a new identity that allows us to be detached from this sinful world. For all of us who have chosen Christ, we have accepted his gift of salvation. And that means that we have changed kingdoms. We are no longer a part of the kingdom of this world, but we have changed allegiance to becoming children of God. To become citizens of his kingdom. And we are... We belong to Christ Jesus and we are filled with the Holy Spirit because we've chosen to be a part of his kingdom. But even with that, there's freedom still to be won in our lives. There's still freedom that needs to be won in each of our lives. In a similar way, we're warned in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says not to love the world or the things in this world. And you can read the rest of it, but, but that's the highlight I'm going to make. Not to love the world or the things of this world. The world belongs to the enemy 
The world belongs to the devil. He is the prince and the ruler of this world. That's what scripture tells us. Jesus said in John 12, 31 of this fact. I have heard the world described as the devil's mistress. She is seductive and enticing, but it, it's all a trap. She flirts with us and gets us to think that she's got something good to offer us in our lives. And if we are not careful, we'll find ourselves sleeping with the enemy. Well, sleeping with Satan's girlfriend. That's not going to end well for our lives. I'll just let you know that. As citizens of God's kingdom, we need to learn to live in a manner that is worthy of the calling that we have received from God. This means we cannot be double-minded in our hearts and in our minds. As if we have enough of this world, we can have enough of this world to enjoy the pleasures of it without getting burned by the experiences that you can't be on the fence. It's a black and white issue for God. Scripture makes it black and white. James makes it black and white. You cannot be friends with the world. You must be enemies of the world. As Christians, we, can, we are given the title of saint. I know the word saint is easily misunderstood and, and because we typically associate it with people that are particularly good and virtuous in their life, it has become a common saying for a lot of people, well, I'm no saint. I'm sure many of us have said that before. I'm no saint. But no Christian can honestly say this. We are all saints. Paul did not address a single letter of his epistles to the sinners of such and such area uh, in Corinth or Ephesus or Thessalonica. He never said that. It's not that all the Christians there were virtuous, but being a saint is not something that you earn. It is an identity that serves as a foundation for virtue in our lives. When it comes to understanding what it means to be a saint, it helps me to think about the Old Testament priests, especially look at Aaron. Aaron, the brother of Moses, he was not an overly virtuous person. He actually led the entire nation into sin. If you remember that, he made the golden calf. It was Aaron who made the golden calf. Listen to the, the, the complaints from the people. He made this golden calf. And he said, all right, go ahead, worship it. All right, so it was Aaron who did this in Exodus 32. Not great credentials to become a priest of the Lord. Aaron was not made sacred because he was without sin. Instead... When this sinner, Aaron, became a priest, he was sanctified. I know that's a churchy word. Sanctified means set apart for God's use and given a new identity. He belonged to God and whatever belongs to God is holy and sacred. Everything that was dedicated to God and his possession became sacred. This was true of the tabernacle, the, the things in it, the sacrifices offered to God and the people that served him. They were holy because... They belong to God, and God was not of this world because God was holy. As a saint, we have become holy. This implies more than what we might think. The idea of holiness is less to do about your good behavior, and it has more to do about belonging to the kingdom of God. Because God is holy, we can be holy. He's the one that makes us a holy people. And we are to be a mirror image of God's holiness by how we live our life. But as we see in this letter Paul, with, from Paul, we must be on alert to the sins of our lives. Guarding our lives and guarding the church from the corruption caused by the sinfulness of this world. Ephesians 5, 27. Cindy, can you pull that up for me, please? Thank you. He did this to present her himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. This is... This is Jesus, why Jesus died for the church, why he died for us, so that we could be holy and blameless and blemish free. Then it goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. The Spirit clearly says that some will abandon the faith and abandon the truth that God has laid out in His Word and will follow deceiving spirits and things being taught by demons. Are, are, do you not see that playing out in your life today? So this future prophecy that is made 2,000 years ago is being fulfilled today. The devil is a master liar and his best lies sound the most like truth. 
And every good lie has some element of truth. And I recently saw someone post on Facebook saying that they find themselves in the middle on many topics, especially spiritual ones or biblical ones, whatever. I, I'm right in the middle and I'm constantly seeing all sides to every discussion, even biblical ones. I see, I see the good in what God teaches, but I see the good in what people are feeling that are on the other side. That does not make it right. A clock that doesn't run is right twice a day. What is more dangerous, a clock five minutes wrong or a clock that's five hours wrong? Probably the one that's wrong by five minutes, I'd say, if you were to ask me. When we look at a clock that's five hours wrong, you know what we say? Oh my gosh, throw away that clock, it's broken. Five hours off, are you kidding me? But if we see a clock that's five minutes wrong, we're like, oh, we just got to remember it's off a little bit and we'll just remember. It's okay, it's just five minutes off. We can make adjustments to that on our, on our, in our schedule and things like that. Well, even though it's five minutes off, it's still wrong and still bad. The devil is a clever liar. He makes these lies that are very close to the truth so he can get us to believe them and he continues to move us further and further away from the truth. There's this clearly black and white. God makes it black and white with the truth and what's happening is he blurs it and makes it gray and as he does that we're like okay well that's kind of close it's just five minutes off and so he moves us a little bit further this way like okay I can accept that truth okay I guess I guess I can blur that a little bit yeah yeah okay and as what happens is he then moves to another thing and moves us and he moves us and he moves us and he moves us and then we all of a sudden wake up and we see that we are so far away from the truth. And he has blinded us by making one step, by saying, no, that's not that bad. We can, we can allow that. We can kind of bend that truth a little bit. And he's moving us just a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further away from the truth of God's word. And soon enough, you look around and you're like, how in the world have we gotten here? How in the world do we not know the difference between a boy and a girl? Example, but that's the truth, and that's the trick. I mean, that he's good at what he does. The devil is good at what he's done. Asking, I often say this. I often tell people this whenever they don't understand how they've gotten gotten their life into a certain situation. I often say the devil is really good. He does. Look at Revelation chapter twelve. It tells us that he convinced a third of all heavenly hosts, a third of all angels that experienced the unhindered glory of God, that were in God's presence. He talked a third of them into falling away from God. That's pretty. That's pretty insane. So he's got some talent. So combating the enemy is very complicated and it's not a simple thing to do, but it's possible. We must fear God and cling to his word. We need to stick with the truth that we know from his word and not let the lies of the enemy and the deceptions from this world to infiltrate us and to change us into believing something that is not truth and allowing us to corrupt our lives. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So we have to have this surrender to him so that he can help us to be everything that he has called us to do and that he has died for us to do. Worship team, you can come up here, please. And so where does that leave us today? Well, I'd like us to just do something simple. It's just going to be a time for you to evaluate your life. You're the only one in this room that really knows how you're living your life. The things that you're doing, the things that you're allowing. And so I, I want you to kind of spend some time and do some self-reflection. I've kind of laid it out there for us that God has called us to be, especially if you're a Christian today, God has called us to be holy, pure, and sanctified for him. And only you can, as the body of the Christ, because you're the body of Christ, you can make that evaluation on your life. Or you can do as we talked about earlier and you can pray, God, will you please, or as, as King David said, search my heart, oh God. Search my heart. Will you reveal to me where I have corrupted what you have died to be holy? Can you reveal to me areas of my life that I have allowed to be corrupted because I've made the world my friend? 
instead of making it my enemy. God, will you search me because you paid too high of a price for me to allow myself to be tarnished. You've saved me and I'm running back to the darkness instead of being embraced by the light. Lord, I'm allowing this culture to change my mind. I'm allowing this culture to lie to me instead of standing on the truth that you have taught me and how you have showed me. And so we're going to sing this song and and I just want to tell you that it's, it's super the change can happen easily. First it starts with confession and repentance. God forgives you already. All you have to do is ask for it. Say, God, I'm so sorry for the things that I've allowed my life to be a part of. I'm so sorry for these things that I've allowed in my life. I've allowed the enemy to have access to my life, and I want to cast that out. I just want to forgive me and help me to start being led by the Holy Spirit and by your word instead of by the things that my flesh desires. Number one. And then surrender. Holy Spirit, teach me how to live a life that's pure for you. Not that, I'm not asking anyone to be perfect. God's not asking anyone to be perfect. Because he's the one that perfects us. He perfects us. You can't be perfect. But what we can do is set our lives apart. And say, I'm not going to let this world make us anything, make me anything but Jesus'. I'm not going to allow myself to be prostituted to this world. I'm not going to let it have any part of me. I am his. I'm going to be his bride that is pure, that is set apart for when he comes back, he can say, oh yeah, she, she waited on me. She waited on me. Can't wait to have, I can't wait to have her. And we can be that for Jesus. Will you please pray with me?